Attention, all curious minds, innovators, and trendsetters. It's time to pause, lean in, and get ready for an extraordinary journey as we dive deep into the fascinating realms of life, technology, entertainment, and business. Let's explore, learn, and grow together. Brace yourselves for the next thrilling episodes of Hit Their Talks is about to take off. Counting down from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. One and here we go. Hi everyone, Zoltan here. We're back again with Hip to Talks this week, and we're sticking to the blockchain, fintech, regulatory landscape. Uh, I'm already making excuses for my voice. I have a, a mild cold, uh, so I hope you are hearing my words well. Uh, but uh, hopefully, I will need not do the talking today because I have Alexandra. Osovska, uh, PhD and uh, managing partner at FinTech Legal, uh, Fin Legal Tech. Sorry about that. Yeah, Hi, no, Alexander. Everyone makes these mistakes. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. All right. So it's nice to have you here. And uh, yeah, uh, as we usually do here on Hip to Talks, we like to give our guests the opportunity to say a few words about themselves. So, Alexandra, tell our audience who are they going to talk today. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alexandra Sovska. Uh, as Zoltan said, I am a managing partner in uh, FinLegal Tech. This is a law firm specializing in the innovation in the financial market. We provide legal and regulatory advisory for both traditional regulated financial institutions like payment uh, institutions, investment firms, crowdfunding platforms, as well as startups. Uh, mainly from the fintech industry, of course. Uh, we also deal with uh, companies uh, implementing decentralized solutions and based with, on crypto assets. Um, the area of my specialization also covers uh, issues related with anti-money laundering and compliance. And apart from that, I am also a researcher and academic teacher. I did my PhD on investment crowdfunding. So generally speaking, the um, sphere of alternative finance is my passion and something that I do uh, for a living. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, so my first question for you would be about if, if, if you, because you're somebody who is involved uh, in legal support for blockchain, and crypto assets as well. Uh, what do you think that are the biggest legal challenges that we are currently facing in the crypto industry? Because there are plenty probably. And, <laughs> and how can companies navigate these issues effectively? Well, if I was to choose the only one, I would say that the biggest legal challenges is the legal uncertainty uh, and the differing approaches to regulation uh, across different jurisdictions. And this is not only a theoretical issue because it has really significant practical implications. For instance, strictly regulated uh, institutions like banks often hesitate to cooperate with such companies because they are not sure whether this activity is entirely legal or not. And as a result, crypto companies struggle with very basic tasks like opening a simple bank account, uh, which is absolutely fundamental for every yeah. business. And in my opinion, there is no simple solution to this problem, but the most effective way to navigate this challenge, or at least to try to do it, uh, is to, let's say, legitimize the business activity by obtaining a license from a credible uh, authority. So for this reason, I've never recommended my clients setting up a company in so-called crypto heavens, such as the British Virgin Islands or the Seychelles, uh, because while this jurisdiction seemed uh, attractive, in my opinion, this is only a temporary solution because to scale a business and to be seen as a serious market player, uh, companies must opt for more formalized path because uh, losing credibility on the market is very easy. And once you lose it, probably regaining it would be impossible. Yeah, I, I had this in my, my TEDx talk. Uh, it takes uh, 20 years to build your reputation and maybe yes. five seconds to ruin it. 
So yeah, it's interesting because uh, I think this is the first time on our podcast when we talk about the legal side of Mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And in 2016, when we got started with the iGaming conferences, Mm -hmm. we were talking about, of course, compliance. And it was the same thing. Each uh, jurisdiction, different scenarios. And yeah, it's, it's very interesting to see that now blockchain is at the same Yes, I, th- I think this is the problem of every new sphere, I would say. So, of course, this thing is getting better and better because each year we observe that the regulatory approaches across the jurisdictions are getting more unified because, for example, there is some official statement of the Estonian supervisory authority and then uh, supervisory authority in different country is thinking, okay, maybe they're right. So uh, let's we'll copy, copy and paste. Similar. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, so they are inspiring each other. All right. So, so you represented several financial institutions before the regulatory bo- regulatory bodies yeah. like the Polish Financial Supervision Authority. Uh, so, how can you describe the current regulatory landscape for fintechs and blockchain? Uh, in Poland, and how does it compare to other countries in Europe? Uh, did you guys copy paste it from Estonia, or? <laughs> yeah, well, generally speaking, I think that Poland, as in general, is a very good place for financial innovation because we have very strong financial sector and very talented people, especially in IT. Uh, however. It's important to know that while the Polish financial market is growing in the traditional finance, I would say, the decentralized finance and blockchain-based solutions are still in their infant stage. Uh, For example, payment sector in Poland is quite innovative compared to other countries. Uh, We have Blick. Uh, There is a great adoption of uh, mobile payment, instant payment. Uh, You can pay cashless almost everywhere, in a bakery, in a small flower shop, etc. But blockchain industry faces uh, several challenges, of course, mostly because of this legal legal, uh, uncertainty that I have just described uh, before, because in Poland, we don't have any specific regulation for crypto assets company. There is some fragmentary regulation in the Anti-Money Laundering Act, but it's it's only a small part of the business. So generally speaking, there is no uh, a specific regulation for, for uh, such companies. So uh, this is the problem. And uh, I believe that this will change in the future because um, in a few months, the MICA regulation will be yeah. applicable. Yes. Yeah? So I think it will, will cre- create a clear rules for crypto asset service providers for setting up their businesses, for um, uh, providing services to, to, to clients. So this should give companies uh, the confidence to grow in more regulated and stable environment. But right now, uh, Polish crypto market uh, is at the very early stage when we compare it to different companies. Many of my clients are thinking about setting up a company abroad because they are not sure whether their activity uh, will be classified in this way or that way. So they prefer to go to different uh, jurisdictions, even if it's like three or five thousand more expensive because of yeah. the, the currency, the operational costs and so on. But they prefer to pay more, but just to be sure that their activity is entirely legal. All right. So probably Estonia, right? Yeah, Estonia, Switzerland, uh, Lithuania, Latvia. There are, there are many countries. It, it really depends what we are looking for because yeah, yeah, yeah. Some countries are, are better for this kind of services and other countries for this kind of services. It, it, it really depends. But yeah, there are some, let's say, preferred jurisdictions. All right. Yeah, we know uh, we've been talking to uh, many Estonians as well on this. All right. So uh, let's also talk about crowdfunding uh, yeah. and financial innovations, because you mentioned that you were involved, uh, you have experience in this. So 
With your experience uh, in crowdfunding, what are some yeah. of the key legal considerations that need uh, that new crowdfunding platforms or startups should be aware of? And how do you see uh, crowdfunding evolving in the next few years? Because it has been a rolling, stopping, rolling, stopping in yeah. the past five years. Uh, and let's say particularly in the context of blockchain and crypto assets. Uh-huh. Well, uh, from my experience in representing crowdfunding platforms in licensing process, I see that uh, one of the biggest challenges is meeting the capital requirements. Because uh, right now, many platforms don't realize that under the new ECSP regulations, their activity uh, is regulated very similarly to traditional financial institutions like investment All firms. Right. So this means that they have to comply with very stringent uh, legal requirements and not all companies can handle this. So as a result, uh, we are seeing fewer crowdfunding platforms uh, on the market with only large wall structures players still in the game. So right now, uh, there are only, I think, five crowdfunding platforms uh, with the ECSP uh, license uh, in Poland. Uh, which is not very impressive. Um, so, but 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 the problem is this regulatory burden. Not all uh, crowdfunding platforms were ready for these regulations, and uh, you know it it was a very revolutionary uh, change. So th they couldn't handle it. So uh, answering your second question about this uh, crypto assets and and token interest. Of course, there is a growing interest in implementing some decentralized solution in crowdfunding. But, well, this is incredibly complex. Uh, the, huh. legal, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the legal classification of tokens isn't consistent across um, Europe. So what constitutes a security or a financial instrument is different in every jurisdiction. So every country has different definition of security and so on. So until there is a unified approach in Europe on what qualifies as a security or financial instrument, I believe that blockchain-based crowdfunding platforms are unlikely to gain popularity. But I know okay. that ESMA is currently working on that because there were some guidelines or on how to classify a particular token as a security. So right now they're you know, working on the, let's say, universal uh, approach. So I believe this will change in the future, but still there is, um, uh, there is some time needed. And in the future, I expect uh, crowdfunding to be more professionalized, like uh, the traditional financial market. So with fewer but stronger players dominating the market. And once regulatory framework like uh, MICA or some official financial supervisory statement uh, will be published and more clarity uh, will be on the token classification, we might see uh, implementing blockchain solutions in crowdfunding platforms, but I think there is still some huh. sometimes that uh, needs to pass away. All right. So, so you work with uh, startups and you work yeah. with them very closely, uh, especially in the fintech sector. So uh, you also help them develop legally compliant business models, and this is very important. Uh, so what are some of the the common legal pitfalls uh, that fintech startups face now and what advice would you give to, to the founders uh, in this space to avoid them this is like something like a pro bono thing that you might give to <laughs> okay well uh, i would say that the most common mistake is underestimating the complexity of regulatory requirements so many founders focus heavily on the product development on the innovation but forget to make sure that their business model is uh, compliant with all applicable regulation. And sometimes I hear, okay, but you will find a way to make it legal. And okay, I will, but A, this is not easy to implement once the product is already developed. I mean, to refine the whole business model. B, 
this is not cheap because there are some changes that are, are needed. And C, you may not like it because the regulatory burden may be too strict for you. So for instance, uh, startups uh, very often forget that uh, some services might be regulated and they misclassify their services, not realizing that, for example, holding uh, virtual wallets uh, can be classified as uh, uh, providing uh, payment services and you need a particular license uh, to do that. So my advice for founders is simple. Uh, engage with legal experts early in the process just to make sure whether your business model falls under regulations or not. And if so, what license or what approval you will need. So this is important to build compliance from the scratch uh, because it is much harder and, of course, more expensive to fix legal issues later once it's already done. All right. So let's also talk about uh, AML, uh, anti-money laundering and uh, counterterrorism financing, uh, which are very crucial issues in the crypto space. Uh, yeah. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> so could you share yeah, some but, insights? But, but you know, King is still the cash. So the, the, the most yes, yes. transactions are made in cash, not in crypto. Yeah. yeah it's it's strange how, uh, how, how the perception is like that. Yeah, so. that's true. Could you share some insights on the challenges of implementing AML uh, CTF measures in decentralized finance and uh, what steps can companies take to ensure compliance? Well, implementing anti-money laundering measures in the decentralized finance is particularly challenging because of this lack of centralized control. And I would even say that sometimes it's impossible to comply with all anti-money laundering regulations. Uh, for example, how to appoint uh, AML officer where there is no one responsible for the project. And to be honest, I have never met fully decentralized project. I only worked with some companies implementing some decentralized solutions or products. So it's easier for them to implement anti-money laundering uh, measure. But Based on that experience, uh, I would say that uh, companies operating in the DeFi sphere, they should take following steps. So first of all, develop a compliance framework. So even if your company is not explicitly covered by anti-money laundering regulations, it's better to have uh, AML policy in your company. Because uh, many companies, uh, for example, crypto exchanges, they require from their business partners like uh, token issuers to have uh, well-structured anti-money laundering uh, policy. So just be prepared for that. And the second advice is to integrate compliance tools because there are so many automated AI-driven analytic tools that can track and analyze transactions then uh, they can scan your clients on the sanction list, politically exposed uh, person list. Uh, they can help you to conduct customer due diligence. So it just making things easier. So uh, I would say that uh, especially in, in this kind of activity where everything is online without the personal presence, it's better to have this, have this automated. Yeah, especially since our seamless a uh, world now everything has to move <laughs> fast otherwise you just go to the next one who has that tool sure. yeah. yeah it's a very interesting and probably uh very exciting time for lawyers uh because most probably 20 years ago there were different uh, things that in the in the legal field they were important but now it's it's like a new world of course, and you know it's it's interesting because sometimes uh I talk to more experienced lawyers than I am. They are like, they have 40 years of experience and they have no idea about these issues that are, you know, taking place right now. And it's absolutely normal. You cannot specialize yeah. in in, in yes. everything, but it's incredible that um, younger people, sometimes the, the knowledge is uh, much more developed and much more wide than, than experienced uh, people. So yeah, yes. it, it's changing and 
it, it will change in the future as well. So yeah, probably we, in forty know, years, somebody yeah, exactly. will say this about you as well. That yeah. All right, these guys don't know how uh, the uh, I don't know traveling in time legal stuff works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so so licensing is like a complex area for many financial institutions, yeah. as we know. So, what are the, some of the key aspects of licensing proceedings that companies should prepare for, uh, especially if they are seeking approval bodies uh, from approval bodies like the Polish? Uh, Financial Supervision Authority. Yeah, so Polish KNF is quite strict. So this is the first thing I would like to highlight. So in my opinion, one of the most critical steps in licensing process is preparing a complete and accurate uh, application with all uh, required uh, attachments. So this includes ensuring that the documentation provides clear and comprehensive answer to all regulatory requirements. So a well-prepared submission significantly reduces the chance of additional inquiries from a regulator, which can, of course, delay the approval process. Because, for example, once you... Um, submit the application with all the documents, you can expect the answer in a few months. But uh, of course, if there are some additional questions, the process may, y y y they can be prolonged to few years even, yes? Yeah? So it's, it's better to avoid it. And uh, in my opinion, transparency is the key. So be ready to provide a detailed explanation of your business model, your organizational structure, financial plans, and so on, and ensure that all documentation from procedural description to, I don't know, IT security protocols are coherent, professional, and what's important, easy to understand. Because you are an expert in your product and your services, but uh, on the other side, there are some normal people that are not an expert in the technology that you are using and your product, your business model. So try to explain it as easy as possible. And uh, what's important, uh, even with this throughout uh, preparation, it's important to uh, anticipate additional question from the regulator. So sometimes they may even ask for uh documents or explanation that are not explicitly required by law so being flexible and responsive can really help make it easier make this process moving smoothly as and and and, and fast all right so you are also because we of course read your bio and uh, <laughs> when we met you in uh, warsaw earlier in october uh, yeah by the way alexander was a speaker at our conference in warsaw at european gaming congress so you are also a member of the supervisory board at the aip uh, seed vc fund yes. uh, and you're involved in supporting early stage ventures so what qualities or legal structures do you look for in startups especially those in the fintech space uh, to ensure that they have a strong foundation for growth rather than just mm -hmm. like uh, i don't know if you remember like a vladimir at our conference says they just like grow and then they yes. get hit by legal <laughs> stuff and go exactly. down yes yes well even if i am not personally involved in the investment process and you know choosing the right yeah. company to invest i still have some observation so i would say that the most important uh, quality we look for is uh, whether the startup is solving a real problem. Because often I see founders are creating a product or service first and then try to figure, to try to fit it to a particular need. And yeah. the approach should be the other way around. Start by identifying a clear gap in the market and then develop a solution to address it. So still many, many, many people don't understand this. And what's more, well, personally, I value adaptability uh, and startups that are willing to refine their product and approach based on the feedback are more likely to succeed in the long run. And uh, I would say it's not only from the business perspective, but also from the legal perspective, because the regulations are changing. So sometimes once new regulations 
are in force. You need to refine your business model and comply with different regulations. And some companies cannot do it. The the, the best example is uh, the crowdfunding market. Um, so there are many crowdfunding platforms just, you know, stopped uh, working because they couldn't change their business model and to comply with uh, with regulations. All right. So let's also, as a closing question, look forward uh, on how do you envision the regulatory framework evolving for crypto assets in fintech in Europe? Uh, and are there any trends or upcoming changes that you think that will significantly impact the industry besides Mika, of course? Yeah, well, the regulatory framework for crypto assets and fintech in Europe is generally heading towards greater clarity or harmonization. So, of course, this uh, MICA is a significant step forward that will create a unified set of rules. This is not only one act that will, you know, make it uh, more universal. So I believe that uh, we will see this market getting more mature uh, in the future, similarly to this crowdfunding market. Uh, because the requirement to obtain a license combined with very strict compliance obligations will likely lead us to the situation where landscape will be dominated with uh, big players, uh, large scale professional entities. And this will bring, of course, more stability to the market. Uh, but however, there is also a downside because small players that are operating right now might be pushed out uh, from the market, yeah, because uh, they might be too expensive or too complex to meet these requirements. And as a result, they may try to operate in so-called gray zone or they may try to move their businesses outside the European Union to avoid this regulatory burden. So... We don't know which direction they will choose, but I am 100% sure that the future will be interesting and intense for us lawyers, yeah? Yeah, uh, it's it's good to know. And at least that uh, in, the, in the fintech and crypto space, you guys are talking yeah. about harmonization in the European Union because that has been the keyword for the gambling industry for the past 10 years and nothing happened. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a different case, uh, and uh, I think it will be achieved much faster. Uh, Alexandra, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we love to have you here, and uh, thank you for our audience for sticking around. And uh, yeah, so that's it. it. So, all right. So, if you have any parting words to say to the audience, be my guest. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. All right. So thank you once again. And uh, guys, we will be back next week with more important stuff. Take good care, everyone. Bye. And that's a wrap for this section of Hit Their Talks. Thank you for being a part of our journey today. Don't forget to tune in next week for more insights and discussions. Stay connected with us on Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, and more. Until then, keep exploring and keep growing. We'll see you next time.